testimonies from other people. Uh, it's just a really relaxed but enjoyable time. And if you guys are stereotypical males like me, we don't do this nearly enough, do we? Right? And the value of getting together is very real. And I would say because this is a church event, like your wives and your kids will allow you to do it. Right? So you got less excuses than you want that you can't do it. Uh, the second thing, uh, I don't, maybe I have one for it, I don't know, but we are starting a class in three weeks called Know Your Bible, Change Your Life. This is year three of us doing that, and we're just continually modifying it, but the whole purpose behind it is to teach the students the best ways for them to study the Bible. Right, we've really narrowed it down to the three-question method, and we're going to be walking through the book of Ruth. If you've done it before and you want to do it, please join. You could help lead it. It's a chance to really develop those skills that allow you personally to know God's Word. Um, the third one that I want to say, and we might have a slide for this one, believe it or not, Rim Rockers, even though we're very stoic in so much that we do, starting Friday at 7 p.m., we are having a 12-hour prayer night. Did you hear me? 12 hours of prayer happening here. Right, this is normally what the Pentecostals do, but there's such value in it. Right? And we're really trying to develop the prayer ministry here. And Dana and Marcia and others wanted to do this. And so it's like, heck yeah, why not? So from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., there will be prayer happening here. And don't worry, you don't have to show up and commit for the full 12 hours and try not to fall asleep. Right? You can just come and engage in different ways. Um, the last thing I wanted to let you know, as our community continues to grow, Right? We're no longer this small group that right? we used to be, um, but we're turning into a formal church. And in order to keep it from getting sloppy, right, we need to implement different positions. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this as it goes, but one that is needing to be done now is for our kids' ministry. The amount of young families we have here and how prolific they are in developing those families, right, we need a preschool coordinator. Six hours a week, paid position with Rimrock Downtown. This is an exciting thing for us to be, ha for, for, to be happening within our church, within our community. And so if that rings a bell with you in, within you at all, and you have questions, D, the children's director, would be the right person to ask those to. Okay. All right. Now let's get to the word. As always, let's uh, invite God into our minds. All right. We've been given free will, so let's take a moment to give him permission. God, we stop all the busyness all the hassle to come into your house to worship you, to learn from you. We give you permission right now to speak to us, Spirit, to point out the truths that we each individually need to see. Whatever those are, God, we humbly surrender our free will to you in this moment. Speak your truth, please. Amen. All right, so last week, this morning, and next Sunday, we are examining chapters 21 through 25 of Deuteronomy. As Moses finishes his, I'm about to die, so I need to tell you sort of things, right? That's the style of sermons that we have right now, right? To the people that he's been leading the last 40 years. These five chapters seem to be a catch-all for him to throw in some somewhat random and various laws that he has. Now, instead of delving into the specific laws that are in here, as a teaching team, we decided to look more at the nature of the law. And by law, I mean capital L. Now, do you guys know what that means when people say the law? Right? Not the laws, but the law. Right? It's basically the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Any of the laws that were found that were given through the Mosaic Covenant is what we mean when we say the law. Now, our hope Right, in examining the nature of this law is to also look at the guiding principles that a person needs to be thinking through in order to be able to be, understand what was given right, and why God gave it at all. Now, last week we looked at the foundation, or if you were here last week, the first principle. Hopefully that's been on your mind this past six, seven days. What are my first principles? And we looked at the one that which everybody should be reading and interpreting the Mosaic law through, who the lawgiver is. Now, before we get into sorting out what a law says, let me give you an example. A woman shall not wear a man's apparel, nor a man put on a woman's garment, right? Deuteronomy 22.5. Before we get into figuring out what that means, we first need to say, all right, who gave this and why did he give the law at all? Now, this morning, we're going to build off of this foundation by getting even more scholarly or heady or Bible nerdy, depending on how, what your view is of this style of approach. 
Now, we're going to be looking at some more important principles of how we, as in you and me and everyone on this side of Jesus and his cross, should be viewing the law God gave to the Israelites through Moses 3,400 years ago. Now, I will warn you or excite you, depending on who you are as a student, right? This is going to be much more teaching than preaching. Now, if you came here to get those tingles that you sometimes get, right? The tears jerking at the corner of your eye when I'm yelling at you. I'm sorry, you're not going to get that this morning. Right, this is Mr. Hayes wanting to teach his students more formal things about the Bible, specifically the law. Now, I wish I could spread it out over a few weeks, but we just don't have that time or the attention spans. And so I decided, man, there's no other way around this. I just need to give you all three of these important principles today. And so with that, I, I let you know that so that way you are expecting properly what type of information is going to be coming at you. It's all really good, but it's going to be like drinking out of a fire hose. I can tell you that. So if there is any questions that you have after the fact, please come and talk to me. I say that all the time, but that's what I want, right? You can shoot me an email. You can just get in touch with me however you desire, so that way we can walk through it more. But the three different principles that we're going to be looking at to help us better understand the Mosaic Covenant is, first one, God is a covenantal God. Second one, the purpose of the law for Israel. And the third one, the purpose of the law for us for people on this side of the cross. And again, law, capital L, is referring to the commandments found throughout the entire Old Testament. And like I just mentioned, so you guys know, each one of these are a sermon in and of itself. So we're going to be moving quick to try to cover it quicker than I like. But please come and talk to me if you have any questions at all. All right, so let's get into it. So the first one, God is a covenantal God. Now this one is really, really important to know about our God. That he is a faithful God that establishes covenants with his people. Now, covenant, that's really easy to define. It's an agreement. It's very similar to signing a lease or taking out a loan. The stipulations of the agreement are laid out ahead of time so that way both parties are agreeing before they sign those dotted lines. Right? Throughout the Bible, there are five different covenants that God enters into, either with humanity as a whole or specifically with his people. Someday we'll definitely unpack those because it shows us so much about who our God is and what his plans are for his creation. But in the context of Deuteronomy, God and his people are entering into what is labeled as the Mosaic Covenant. Now, as an English teacher, you guys could probably figure out what mosaic as an adjective means, right? What does that sound like? Moses, right? It came through Moses, Mosaic Covenant. So in Exodus 19, we see this formal agreement taking place. Verses four through seven. You have seen what I, God, did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So God's giving this to Moses, and Moses is supposed to go and give these words to the people. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded them. Now, after Israel understands the general nature of the covenant, that God is in charge, and if they want him to continue to, continue to protect and provide him, provide for them, then they must keep all of the stipulations that he's given. Right? He then lays out those 613 laws that they must follow in order to abide by this covenant. Now, this is just like when you sat down in your banker's office to sign those three dozen times right, to get the loan for your house. The opening paragraph, it gives you a general summation of the loan and what you're agreeing to. And then the 20 plus pages that follow lay out these stipulations. Now, in this moment we see described in Exodus 19, one that happened only moments, only weeks after they were rescued from Egypt, God clearly lays out the conditions of the covenant that he is entering into with the people of Israel. Before we officially end Deuteronomy, right, and before they enter into the land of Canaan, we'll go through this one more time, right, in chapters 27 and 28, and we'll unpack this covenant a little bit more. But right now, the only thing that I want you to be noticing and recognizing is that this, the laws that are given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are given in a covenant between God and whom? Israel as a nation back in approximately 1446 BC. This is a crucial lens in understanding how to read the Mosaic Law. 
As with any of the formal contracts that we enter into today, the agreement only applies between the parties that were there when the agreement was made. And in this case, who was it between? God and the nation of Israel back in the 1500s BC. Now, based on that logic, what should we be saying about the Old Testament law and us today? Was it given directly to us? No. Are we then underneath the same covenant that God was with, with Israel? No. Now, I know this might be a little bit new and even startling to some of us, and I will spend you the time showing you the biblical evidence that supports this. But first, I want to make sure that none of you are misreading what I am saying. Did I say that because the covenant was not between God and us, that the laws have no value for us today? No, I did not. Please do not allow your mind to wander down that train of thought. Like we saw last week, God is the all-powerful creator and his wisdom, it is perfect. That means that the truths that he gave 3,400 years ago to Israel were exactly what they needed to receive. And we'll look more specifically at that during our second point. God's perfect wisdom, it also means that many of the laws that he gave back then are universal, which means that they are applicable to all of mankind. We'll look more at that closer in our third point. Right now, I just do not want you to hear me saying that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. That is such a silly and destructive lie that is so common throughout our culture. God never changes, and his instructions always have been and always will be exactly what humanity needs to live the best ways we can. Now, as we continue forward, please don't allow that filter to fall off as we examine some of the different covenants that God has entered into with his people. With the Mosaic Covenant, everything that I'm seeing in the Bible is showing me that it was always intended to be temporary. Now, like always, on a Sunday morning, we don't have time to really get into that, but let me show you some of the verses that I have found that have pointed this out to me. The first one is from Jeremiah. He was a prophet that lived during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, right, when he marched into Jerusalem and utterly destroyed it. The reason he was allowed to do that was because God was honoring the stipulations that were laid out in the Mosaic Covenant, that if you do not hold me as your God, as your primary source of life, then I will not protect you and I will not provide for you. Israel had turned away and so God said, all right, I won't honor that covenant. Now during this time of distress though, it's amazing. God gives his people hope. The fact that there is a new and a better, pro better covenant that will come their way. Jeremiah 31, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the Mosaic covenant, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. Man, I love this passage. Do you know who said this? I just told you. But this is an Old Testament prophet. How often do you think about Old Testament prophets delivering this level of love and grace in their words? And that clearly shows me that the God of the Old Testament has always been the same God all the way through. Now let's take a moment to think about this logically. When somebody enters into a new or a revised covenant with someone, what happens to the former covenant that they were in? It's done away with, right? They are no longer bound to it and to its stipulations. This means that the Mosaic covenant was never meant to be more than a covenant between the ancient nation of Israel and God himself. Now we see more support for this in the New Testament. Let me show you just a couple passages. Hebrews 8. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry. And to that degree, he is a mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We could keep going, but do you guys recognize that? He, who is he quoting? Jeremiah, the passage that we just looked at. 
Now, in, the author of Hebrews is clearly stating who is bringing about the new and better covenant. It's Jesus. He is the initiator and the mediator of an agreement that everyone has the ability to enter into with God. Right? Not just the nation of Israel, anyone more, but everyone. And this one supersedes a temporary and imperfect covenant that God had made with Israel through Moses. In Matthew 5, right near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus confirms these same truths. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Please notice that he first validates the laws and the importance of the agreement between God and Israel, right? And all of the different stipulations that flow out of that. He says that I have not come to abolish, which in the Greek abolish means to destroy, to demolish, to make invalid, right? Instead, he came to do what? To fulfill which means to make complete or to finish. You know, we'll get a chance to look at this more next week, but the total forgiveness and complete reconciliation of God, of man to God that Jesus brought about, it happened through the stipulations of the Mosaic law. That's why he said, I did not come to abolish it. He's like, no, I lived through that to bring about this new covenant. Because he was able to perfectly accomplish those statutes, right, he was then able to bring about the new covenant that Jeremiah was just telling us about. Let me show you one more piece of supporting evidence for this truth, that the Mosaic covenant was for the people before the cross. And for those of us living after Jesus' sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection, we have the ability to enter into a new and far better covenant. This one, just like the other one, comes straight out of the mouth of Jesus. Luke 22. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So what do we refer to this as? Lord's Supper, communion, right? But check out this last sentence. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, this cup is poured out for you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. See that adjective, new And we could easily go deeper and deeper into all of this. But for this morning, right now, let me just give you a bigger picture statement. Because God is a covenantal God, in order to best understand the nature of our relationship that we have with him, we must be continually going back to the covenant that we are under with this God. For the Israelites back in Moses' day, and for about another 1,500 years that follow, their relationship with God was defined by the Mosaic Covenant. For us, for those of us that have cried out to Jesus and have been saved from ourselves, right? we have entered into a new covenant that has been brought about by him. Right? Our relationship, therefore, is defined by what is known as the Messianic covenant. Messianic, Messiah, that covenant. So when we read the laws in Deuteronomy, we need to be continually bringing our minds back to this truth. This is not the covenant that we are under. Therefore, what Moses is saying to the Israelites does not, have direct, does not necessarily have direct application to our lives today. As I'll soon show you, there are still, that, mean, that still do apply to 21st century America. But because we are not under that covenant, it is not a straight A to B style equation. Right? Everything that was given to Israel should transfer directly to everything with us today in America. Instead, Understanding how these laws apply to us, it requires some work. I'm sorry to say that to those of us living in a convenience-based society, right? I can't just open up a book and see exactly what it says to me. I got to think and process, maybe even do some praying through it. My goodness. Don't worry, AI is coming, so maybe there will be at some point where we can just plug it, the cord into our brain and get all this. But for right now, right, I want to give you two different lenses, filters, through which you can kind of start to process, all right, these laws that were given before us to a different people. The first one, why God gave Israel the law. So often this is skipped over, and it's sad, because he, like I've been saying, he gave it directly to them, and so if we want to understand the nature of the laws and why he gave it, we have to understand, like, who he gave it to and why they needed it. So one of the main reasons that God gave the law to the Israel, it's to the Israel, was to help them form a nation. 
When they were at Mount Sinai, right, the time when God entered into this covenant with them, they were only a few weeks out from being a bunch of slaves, which means that they were fully accustomed to doing whatever the Egyptians told them to do and nothing else, right? They needed structure then, therefore, in order to be a nation. So let me give you a few examples of what had to be done for a million plus descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to move from being another nation's possession to be in a nation on their own. Now the first, and this is not prioritized anyways, but the first one I'm giving you is that they needed to establish a government of their own. While they were under Pharaoh's rule, they had little to no freedom, which means that they did not have the ability to create any form of structured government. A group of leaders that would govern their nation and help guide it down the path that would be the best for that nation. That means that when God set them free, they needed the guidance on how to structure their leadership, right? We see this clearly done. Let me give you one example. Deuteronomy chapter one, verses 13, right? This shows how the law was helping to establish the leaders in Israel. This is Moses talking to his people. Choose for each of your tribes individuals who are wise, discerning, and reputable to be your leaders, You answered me, the people. The plan you have proposed is a good one. So I took the leaders of your tribes, wise and reputable individuals, and installed them as leaders over you. Commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of ten, and officials throughout your tribes. I also charged your judges at that time. Give the members of your community a fair hearing and judge rightly between one person and another, whether citizen or resident alien. Now, for us seeing it through that filter of what Israel had to have, it makes more sense, doesn't it, why he would have given them this? Right? We were born into a country where this was already set up. The structure of our government, the judicial system, all these different things. But to think through, man, they had none of that? No wonder God had to begin at the very beginning for them with these style of laws. It's also really important to note that the nation of Israel was initially a theocracy. You guys remember that from seventh grade history? What a theocracy is? Theo, right? It's God. So it's a nation that is governed by God. He is their king. Because of this, this is why God had them create a tabernacle. So that way he could dwell in their midst as their king. This is also why he instituted instituted people like priests and Levites and gave them the authority that he gave them because they were under their king, who was God. So this is why the priests have the amount of authority that they have. Let me give you one example of that. Deuteronomy 17. If a judicial decision is too difficult for you to make between one kind of bloodshed and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any such matters of dispute in your town, what should you do? Then you shall immediately go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. This is the tabernacle, soon to become the temple, right, where God, their king, is at, where you shall consult the Levitical priest and the judge who is in office in those days they shall announce to you the decision in that case. Now, as a theocracy, right, it makes sense why priests would have this power. But are we under a theocracy today? No, we're under a democracy. So should priests, right, the ones with the pointy hats and all of that, should they have the same power that's described here? No, but was it necessary for Israel back in this day? Yes. Another piece with that theocracy, right, is that with any monarchy, The king is the ultimate authority of what is right or wrong. Because God was their king, the people of Israel also were taught like what God expected for them to do with their morality, with the choices in the moral area, right? His standards for right and wrong. This is why he gave them commands like the Ten Commandments, to show them how they needed to treat one another, right? Because ours are already like listed through our judicial laws that have been laid out. But for them, it was a blank slate on how they should treat one another. And so God, as their king, said, all right, I need to help you with these. All right, two more reasons why God gave Israel the law. I told you this would be a lot. Hopefully you haven't zoned me out quite yet. The Israelite slavery also meant that they had no identity as a nation. And now this is really important in many ways. Now think about the history of America. What has made us the nation that we are today? Men and women who willingly fought against the oppressive rule of the British. People that sacrificed their lives so that way everyone else in this nation could be free. You guys remember the ending line of our national anthem? We are land of the free and the home of the brave. In so many ways, this is our identity, both as a nation and as individuals that are a part of it. 
I believe that this is why God gave the Israelites the different annual celebrations or festivals that they needed to do. Right? We looked at some of these back in Deuteronomy 16, the Passover, the Festival of Weeks, and the Festival of Booths. He required this of them so that way they would be reminded of who they are as a nation, as his chosen people, as a precious possession grabbed by God from utter slavery. He was doing this because he wanted them to form that identity that this is who we are as a people, this is who, therefore this is who we are as individuals. Let me give you one more foundational piece that the Israelites needed as a nation kind of like plays into what I just described, but they needed to understand how to relate to God. Now, by being raised in and dominated by the Egyptian culture, this meant that the Israelites most likely believed everything that the Egyptians believed about the divine, which was dozens and dozens of different gods, all of which represented different elements of nature. On top of that, they were seen as garbage by Pharaoh, who was also seen as a god. So their view of themselves must have been that we are worthless, that we are the scum of the earth, that we have no value whatsoever in this place, right? I was thinking about uh, India and their social stratification, right? The Israelites at this point were probably like the untouchables are today. Now, this is another reason why God gave them so many of their laws, so that way their minds could be slowly transformed from seeing the divine in a flawed way into a more accurate understanding of who God is and his desire that he has for them, for his people. Now, the greatest commandment that they give, this summarizes all these laws well. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Now think about it a little bit, if we can, through the lens of an Israelite who had just been released from slavery. Right? They had grown up thinking that there was dozens of gods and then to be told that there was only one God, right? And that this God wanted to enter into a loving relationship with them. Imagine hearing that the first time. It had to have been kind of like, really? To the point of that is ridiculous. This means that God had to continually give them opportunities to have their minds slowly transformed from that aired way of thinking into what is true. That's why he gave them the laws that he gave. So that way he could transform his people into into having a correct worldview. Now everything I just gave you, in the summative statement, through the laws, God was forming the nation of Israel. It was essential for them to have everything they were given because of their relative position as being released slaves that were then given the opportunity to become a nation. Now, if you, as you read through it, if you do, think them through this lens, you'll start to see, it'll start to make more sense to you why the laws are the way that they are. All right, so two down, one left. The purpose of the law for us. So now that we've determined that the Pentateuch was given to the Israelites back in 1500 BC, right, and it's a covenant that as followers of Jesus, we do not have to be under, right, I want to end by looking at the purpose, if any, of these laws for us today. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this isn't as easy as pie, right, it's going to require some work, but because God's wisdom is perfect, it is worth making a little bit of effort to see how these may apply to us today. I'm just going to give you some grid work to think through. Right? The first one is so beautiful for me. It's simple. And it basically it removes dozens, if not hundreds, of these laws. Really, the majority of the book of Leviticus is done away with because of these principles. First one, because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that died once and for all, and his sacrifice stands forever, we no longer need a tabernacle or a temple or any of the sacrificial laws that people used in order to be purified through, from their sins. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Hebrews 10.10, clearly states this. It is by God's will that we have been sanctified, perfected, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Read that again. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's like four different verses in Hebrews, Hebrews 7, Hebrews 10, that clearly state this, right? So therefore, do we need to continually be forgiven of our sins? 
Do we need to go before priests? Do we need to offer these different sacrifices, whatever the denominations or the religions have created? No. That has been done away with clearly by the death of Jesus. Is it important to repent? Absolutely. But does our relationship with God change right, based on our sins? No. God also clearly points out that the laws on dietary restrictions, and there were quite a few, that they have been completely done away with. In Acts chapter 10, he gives Peter a vision that nullifies all of the prohibitions that had been put into place for the different things that they couldn't eat. So that means, right, as people in the Messianic covenant, we're able to enjoy barbecue pork and clams and oysters and all the shellfish we desire. Right? The last category of laws that definitely doesn't apply to us is the ceremonial, like the ones we saw in Deuteronomy 16, the ones that God was using to help build the Israelites' identity, right? The Passover, Festival of Weeks, and the Festival of Booths. Now, are these still worth meditating and reflecting on? Absolutely. The Passover is so powerful in showing us what Jesus did for us. But do we have to travel to Jerusalem three times a year in order to celebrate these? No. Why not? because they were given to Israel back in their time to help them remember and not given to us. Now, I found it so beautiful for me when I get that fell swoop answer like this that brings such clarity on so many of the laws. Anything about the sacrificial system, anything about a person's diet, and any of the commands dealing with ceremonies are no longer applicable to us today. Now, with th those three categories removed, it means that there's only one category left for everyone this side of the cross, and that is the moral laws. Now, finding a succinct definition of biblical moral laws wasn't as easy as I thought, but I did find one. Moral law refers to conduct derived from an objective right and wrong. So something bigger, speaking the rights and wrongs into our lives. Moral law usually refers to a higher set of principles that should govern contact, conduct or behavior, how we live. So in more layman terms, these laws are whenever God says that you shalls and you shall nots. It's when he defines to the people how they should live and how they should treat other people. Right? The greatest commandments that Jesus gives are prime examples of this. Let me show them to you. Matthew 22, verse 36, if you needed that. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God. You notice that you shall. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Please notice that last sentence. Right? On these commandments, on these two hang all of the laws and the prophets. He's saying that these two summarize the 613 laws that are given, specifically the moral laws. Now, it's a wonderful thing. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four state exactly what the greatest commandment says, right? More or less, you should love the Lord your God with everything you got. The second six says that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And so you have Jesus saying the two greatest commandments, then those flow into the Ten Commandments that follow. Right? What has also been proposed is that all of the other moral laws that follow those come out of the Ten Commandments. Greatest commandment, Ten Commandments, and then everything else stems out of that. So you can always trace it back to ones that we know are true. Now the fact that Jesus told the people of his day that the overarching principles of the moral laws were still valid, for me, is clear proof that they still apply to us today. Now, I've been finding this understanding to be extremely helpful in determining which laws to pay attention to, but just because we know that the moral laws are in place for us today does not easy, easily clarify how they apply to us right now. Right? Remember, they were given to a people living in a fully different culture, and like we saw earlier, to a theocracy, a nation ruled by God and not a democracy like we live in. And they were also given to a brand new nation that was being formed in revolutionary ways. So this means that the moral laws don't directly transfer us today. So now you've got to be asking that question. Like, all right, haven't you been talking at us for like a half an hour and you still haven't told us which ones to? Right? Sadly, this is a massive topic. And because of that, there are so many nuances that have created serious divides within the Christian church. 
But I want to end by giving you a simple tool, one that can potentially help you to start to recognize as you work through this, which ones apply to you and how they do. Right? You see this, what looks like a bookmark, doesn't it? It's a little bit thicker, like you could slide that into your Bible and keep it there from time to time and pull it out whenever you need it. Right, this was given to me by a really wise, good friend of mine to help me understand how to view the law. So if you need more of these, we have them around. Um, but you'll see the first two, first two hashtags. Those are the, like the theories or the principles that we already looked at. After that, number three, right, are some questions. Is the law reinforced in the New Testament? That's such an important thing to be thinking through. Is the law still reinforced in the New Testament? If it is, then it is still binding for us today. That means any of the laws or the ways of like living, viewing other people that come from the Messianic covenant, they're applicable to us today. That means that if the Old Testament laws model these, even in principle, they are still valuable for us now. The second one, is the law reinforced in the New Testament? Is the law expanded in the New Testament? If so, it's binding. You want to see prime examples of this? Look at the um, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. Jesus is continually grabbing. It's, it was once said, you shall not murder, but I say, and he goes much deeper on what it means. Right? So that means that all of those laws that he's grabbing are still applicable to us today. The third one, does it relate to the Ten Commandments? Like I was telling you, the Ten Commandments stem directly from the greatest commandments, which Jesus gave, right? That means that if there are any moral laws that we find in Exodus, um, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy that stem out of those Ten Commandments, that means that they are still relevant for us today. This one, this one's crucial. Is there pertinent historical background needed to explain the laws? And you got to continually be bringing your mind back to this. Like I've been telling you over and over and over, they lived in a different culture. They were under a different ruling structure, theocracy, not democracy, right? And we have to see our eyes through those, that cultural lens. I'll give you an example here in a sec, but just think about um, what it's like to greet people, let's say in France or in uh, Latin America, right? For somebody like us, like a more of that rancher mindset, if you walked into a room in France and they were kissing you on the cheek, how are you going to feel about that? right? I'm sure Terry would be like blushing, right? Fully. But how do they feel about it? It's just their normal way of greeting. Cultural changes make such differences. And so we have to try to view it through that. So let me give you one uh, example or one um, verse that kind of shows us. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be charged with any related duty. He shall be at home for one year to be happy with a wife whom he has married. Now, seeing this through our cultural lens, for the married couple, it's amazing, right? But for the, everybody else, this is ridiculous. Why would a man be released from all duty for an entire year just to sit around with his wife? But if you start to think about this through their culture, that most of the time, husbands and wives were married through prearranged marriages, which means they didn't even know each other prior to getting married. So that means that year was like our dating time where they actually got to know one another. Also, this was a heavily, this culture was heavily combative. Every spring, the kings would send out their army to war. And by army, I mean every capable man, right? From the ages of 20 and up was sent into the battlefield. And they would be out there for weeks or months trying to do whatever the king wanted them to do. That means if they had just gotten married, he was gone for a majority of that break-in period time. Also, they didn't fight with drones, but rather with swords. And think about the amount of disease that had to have been around back then. So the chances of dying were so much greater. Now, when we see it through this cultural lens, it can help us make more sense of why it was given. And the last one is really important, and we'll kind of attach it to this. If we should not follow it today, which I don't think this law is applicable for us today, that married people should just sit around for a year doing nothing, right? Well, not nothing, but you know, right? If we should not follow it, if not, what is the principle behind the law? So in thinking through that question with the verse that I just looked at, um, one came to my mind. That love between a husband and a wife is critical or crucial in the eyes of God. 
that he definitely wants that love between a married couple to develop. And one of the best ways to do that is by spending time together. Right? This is a, and this is a principle that we see fully encouraged throughout the entire New Testament. All right, we're almost done, I promise. So you see the last one on there? It's bigger for a reason. Because this is the one that we must always start with and end with. As always, remember who the lawgiver is and why he gave the law. So I gave us a lot of different tools as well as principles to be thinking through the laws about. But man, our minds, they're finite, right? And they're broken. We do not have the ability through our logic and through our mental uh, capacities to really truly understand the depth of all these laws. Therefore, we have to continually be hanging on to this first principle, that God is the creator of everything and he wants only what is good for his people. And so when the ones that are confusing come up, you got to bring your mind back to that. Definitely when the ones that are just downright wrong to you, right? Instead of getting stuck in those weeds of trying to figure out why he said that, I found that such value of just bringing your mind back to this first principle of who God is and what his plans and his intentions are for humanity as a whole. All right, so Mr. Hayes as a Bible teacher is done. If you got any questions, like I said, please come and talk to me. I have been seriously thinking, I think I will, I just need to be willing to do it, is to have a question and answer time one of these evenings where you guys can just bring your thoughts to the, of the law to me. I can help you maybe understand them. I've been hesitant because I'm, it's just such a hard thing to do. But I think just with my role, that most likely will be um, promoted and presented here, um, a chance to just gather together and talk through the nitty gritty. Um, but right now, because of the worship team, uh, you'll hear these songs that fit directly into this. It's the beauty of the Spirit, constantly giving them the songs that we need to have. And so this is a chance for us to move from the heady, like we've just been doing, to more of that emotional, um, just to engage with God and to worship Him in the ways that we want to.